and uh, I think you see, I, I, I didn't want to uh, disclose what I will be, would be presenting before, but I just uploaded the videos at, in my chat. So if the streaming is uh, unstable, maybe people can follow in, on the YouTube. But I hope it generates a good discussion, and I, I, I'm sure it will. Okay, so we're right on time. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the presenters for accepting this uh, invite. It's an honor to have all you here from different parts of the world. Um, my name is Felipe Togucci. We are here from uh, the Federal University of Sao Paulo. Uh, this is a weekly meeting of our optical, uh, surgical optics sector. Uh, as we are here, I'd like to thank as well Dr. Uh, Chamon and uh, Dr. Uh, Obdulio, Rafael Kobayashi, and Rafael Arantes for helping with this uh, coordination and organi organizing this, this meeting. Uh, so this this meeting uh, in this meeting we have four uh, expert surgeons that will present two cases uh, each, and one is a routine case, so we can uh, see how uh, the FACO is performed around the world. And feel free, anyone who wishes to ask questions or um, comments, please. Uh, we are all here to learn, and. The second one is a challenging case. I think uh, everyone has different ways of approaching it. It will be interesting to see uh, how each one does uh, different does it in different situations. So uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Neto Rosatelli so he can start his uh, video's presentation. Firstly, I I think we will try to share the screen, okay, Dr. Neto? Yeah. And if there is any issue with the with the videos, we can uh, link the their corresponding uh, uploads on YouTube or try to reproduce it from from host, okay? Okay. Thank you, thank Felipe. You. I, and, I thank you very much. I, hello, everybody. I would like to say that it's an honor to be here in such a useful company. And take, I take the opportunity to greet our international guests, Dr. Ildai Devgan, Dr. Lukan Mishev, and Dr. Deepak Megur. And it's a pleasure to be here, and I hope it will be a very productive meeting. Okay, is it on screen, Felipe? So, our, our first uh, show, one of my routine techniques I employ, it's not the one I employ mo the most, but the technique that I find very, um, very good for soft to medium hardness nucleus. And it's a, a very satisfying technique to use. Um, to complement this technique, this FACO technique, I, for, before I do the FACO, it's important to release the nucleus and the nucleus completely. So the nucleus will rotate and the technique will work. It, uh, it's not uh, every time that we are able to achieve a, let's say, a very beautiful uh, rotation and emulsification of the nucleus, as you will see in this one. But even when the rotation of the nucleus uh, fails, it works uh, very well, and it's a very, um, let's say, a very little invasive or less invasive techniques. So there is almost no movement 
of the faculty and things happen only by the fluidics of the of the 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 interocular flow when we are emotive and it's very important to achieve a very good hydrodissection and i also employ a hydro delineation technique here so that the nucleus and the epinucleus and cortex are released from the uh, capsular bag and you see as many people follow me on the channel that i have a technique that i developed and you will see now which i call this it's spinning the nucleus many times in each direction so uh, to not only achieve nucleus release but also all if possible all cortex be released from the uh, capsular bag so the so that cortical aspiration is greatly facilitated or even it is it is not even necessary because all cortex is released so i'm beginning the the technique which is a carousel it's a very known technique it's uh, not very easy to be proficient in that it requires a little training but when it goes well it's a it's a very fast and as i said there is very little movement of the faculty sleep inside and only the epinucleus is uh, remaining now and aspiration is very easy because the previous maneuvers not only the hydro dissection and hydro delineation released it from the capsular bag and but also the nucleus is spin another technique i like to do is to hydro implant the iol uh, and the reason for that is that uh, you avoiding by avoiding use of OVD in that step, um, there is very little OVD remaining after the IOL implantation. And so, um, it, it not only speeds up the surgery, but also avoids IOP spikes afterwards. And it's a very easy technique to use, not very, it's very useful, especially in high, with hydrophilic IOLs, uh, with injector type, uh, with plunger type injections, when you, you just press like a syringe. And in screw type injectors, it's not uh, possible to use this technique. But, um, I think it's a, a, a very easy and safe technique, even for beginner surgeons. And I, that's the technique of IOL implantation I employ most of the time. So now the rest of the surgery is just uh, sealing up the incisions. And uh, I really would like to know the participants' view on that, these techniques. The technique I use most for nucleus uh, management is a mechanical fracturing technique. But I wanted to show this uh, other one, which is not very employed by many surgeons, and I like very much. So I'd like to see the participants' opinion on that. Beautiful surgery, Neto. Thank you, you, Dave. So yeah, I, I like very much how you carousel the nucleus, but as you said, there's a lot of it's not as easy as it looks. The phago yes. probe has to be on its side, and you really have to get the correct angle to get the nucleus to spin. Yes, that's the, the, the most challenging part, is to present the phago, the, the phago opening, the, the tips opening, uh, in a, let's say, in a square aspect to the rotation or uh, so that uh, the, to the to achieve nucleus rotation if you step too much on the pedal or too little it, it doesn't work but with some practice you get the feeling and uh, 
when the nucleus is rotating, you just keep pressing at the right amount and things go by itself. It, what happens most often is that the nucleus, uh, as it gets smaller, it's it, it out of the bag. But it's no problem. You 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 still can uh, emulsify it at the capsular uh, at the safe zone plane, and it's very safe. Uh, it's a very safe technique. This one went beautifully, so I, I decided to to show that so that. Uh, it's easy to appreciate how the movement goes and so some of the mechanics of the technique. It's very important to achieve, to be successful, to achieve complete rotation of the, of the nucleus. And many people ask me if the spin is not aggressive to the zonules. And as the forces are applied tangentially, uh, it is distributed to distributed to all of the zonules, and if you can uh, make the the proper path completely circular, it's really there is no uh, there is really no 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 not a, not very not much power not much force applied to the zonules. It's very zonular friendly. Let me make a comment. Uh, yeah. Some people in the chat are asking if beginners can do it, but I'd like to listen to the opinion of Dr. Mishev or Luca, as well as, as Dr. Megur, Deepak Megur. Can you, can you uh, explain if it can be done by beginners or not? Uh, hi, Dr. Mito. It was wonderful. I think you uh, looks like magic in your hands, but I'm not sure uh, whether it can be, it is reproducible by a beginner surgeon. I think you need to understand the fluidics uh, a little bit better. Uh, what flow rate do you use, uh, Dr. Nito, uh, for your surgery, in your uh, aerosolic lens? What is the flow rate which you use? And I, I'm using the constellation machine. Okay. And uh, yeah. And uh, flow rate is 15 to 40 uh, millimeter minute and cc per minute. And the vacuum is the the machine is operating on Venturi uh, okay. settings. So and uh, the aspiration uh, the the flow rate is. Yes, just as I said, that's 15 to 40. And vacuum is about uh, five to 600 millimeters uh, of mercury. Okay. Uh, again, I think uh, a beginner surgeon, I think he needs a little bit of understanding of fluidics. And uh, uh, once you get the hang of it, probably it will be safe enough. But uh, in the initial part of the learning curve, I think, uh, you just need to understand the basics first and then probably. But uh, Dr. Nito, he just does it wonderfully well. And you know, there is no epinucleus left. Everything comes out in a GIF and most often they're not even cortex come out, comes off uh, in his uh, hands. So wonderful, Dr. Nito. Thank you. Uh, if I can comment, I, I think that uh, the technique is wonderful and it is uh, applicable to every surgeon as long as the hydro dissection is uh, sufficient and uh, well done. Uh, and uh, another thing uh, to note is the hydro implantation of the lens. I also use that technique and I complete, completely agree uh, on the next day, you don't have refractive surprises or less of them. You don't have IOP and the cornea is clear. Uh, you actually uh, turn around less fluid in the eye because you skip the, the step with the evacuation of the visco. So beautiful surgery. Thank you, Dr. Neto. Thank you. Yes, I, I, there is, I'm sorry, but there's one more question and this is my job here. Uh, how many times you go clockwise and anti-clockwise? 10 times. I try to, to go 10 times. I, that's, um, uh, it took me, 
almost one year to get the number. And I methodically, um, let's say, tried or experimented how many times I turn. And 10 times, after 10 times, there is no difference. But uh, one can feel when the, uh, the everything is uh, the nucleus and the epinucleus is completely released. The, the friction you feel uh, changes and you, you can say, no, that's enough. Um, but it takes a long time to do. It's not important the speed. The, 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 the speed of the spin is not important at all, but the, the number of times you turn in each, and it's very important to turn both clockwise and anti-clockwise in, in both directions. I have another question here from the audience. They are asking if I can use this technique with a straight tip. And I think it may be more difficult, but I think, yes, you, you can get the right angle. Um, can I have one more question here? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, have you studied the uh, any PCO rate, a posterior capsular pacification with this technique? Because your the rotation, forceful rotation, I think it really takes care of the equatorial epithelial cells. You know, you do it 10 times clockwise and anti-clockwise. Uh, have you found the incidence of PCO slightly lesser compared to maybe your previous technique or something? Do you have any study or anything about this? Because this no. is the, the nucleus rotation itself will take care of the uh, equatorial epithelial cells. It's yeah. like polishing the equatorial epithelial cells. You don't have access to any instrument which can re reach the equator. So just uh, an, uh, an observation that have you uh, done any study in the past? And, uh, let's say no, not 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 a formal study but from let's say personal observations and that, that's a lot i do many many surgeons per year uh, it's very it's uh, it's uh, very noticeable that uh, the posterior capsule opacification is much less than let's say with uh, the previous way that I did surgery, which with, uh, was not with this uh, technique of the spin. Um, I, I do the spin in virtually all my surgeries. And uh, when I started doing it, the initial, um, the initial uh, intent was really to just release the cortex, but what you just said is very important. I really believe, but I have no way to, to, to assess that, that the epithelial cells are very, uh, are re the rate, the removal rate of the epithelial cells is very high. Uh, after the maneuver, we, uh, I can observe the capsule, at least uh, as, uh, um, in, in the area that I can see, and the capsule ends up very clean. About 90 to 95% of the cases, I don't need to do any cortex aspiration. And from that, I infer that uh, epithelial cells maybe are, 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 are completely or mostly removed. I think that can be a very uh, interesting study to do. Dr. Neto, uh, there is one last question from the chat, yeah. and then I will ask you to move to your next video, okay? Uh, the chat asks if, uh, in case of accidental absorption of epinucleus prior to the nucleus, uh, after you start chopping and aspirating fragments, if it's, if, is that a risk in that technique? Well, Philip, as I understood, uh, it, it was asked if uh, inadvertently I aspirate the epinucleus if there would be any problem. Is that? Yes. Yes. No, no, not at all. Uh, of course, when you have the epinucleus cushion behind the nucleus, it's uh, easier and safer to manage the nucleus. But um, 
it 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 doesn't it's not very it seldom happens that I accidentally aspirate a good portion of the epinucleus in this technique. The nucleus is uh, already very uh, very movable, let's say that, and uh, it's not uh, well. I, I can't remember if this already has happened to me, but even if it would happen. It sometimes happens when I, I turn the, I, I make the spin move, um, a, a, a great amount of cortex and nucleus comes out. In fact, it, uh, this makes it, it makes it easier because then you have more space in the, in the bag when you do the nucleus cracking and to work with the nucleus. Maybe, uh, in harder nuclei, and uh, that would be a problem. But in harder nuclei, usually I don't do the spin very much. Not that necessary because there because there is much less cortex and etc. So it it never it should shouldn't be an issue. Okay. Can we go to the next video, Dr. Neto, please? Okay. Okay. Uh, as uh, some have already told here on Zoom and personally, uh, the video gets a little bit choppy sometimes. Okay. So I'll be sharing the YouTube links on the chat. Uh, it, uh, Zoom doesn't allow to copy the, the link, but uh, you can look for Dr. Neto Rosatelli's channel. It's the two latest videos on, on his channel, okay? Okay, is it there, Felipe? Yes. Yes. So, this next video, I will, uh, most of the surgery will be fast forwarded because that's not the, the whole point of showing it, but I do the, uh, the whole surgery so that uh, people can see, um, well, how it was done. But the main purpose of this is to raise a discussion about the, uh, well, if uh, implanting a single piece IOL in the circus, if that's okay or not. That's uh, my intention here. So this is a, a, a very dense nucleus. And at the end of the nucleus uh, emulsification, notice that there is a, a radial tear in the anterior capsule that extends to the posterior capsule, capsule periphery. Neto, do you want to stop the video? And do you want your poll to be launched? Um, Not yet. No, no, I think after it, uh, I think afterwards, Wallace. So, I should say now, Father, forgive me, I have seen. Huh. And uh, yeah. And here goes the IO well. And uh, discuss the, I think it would be a very good discussion of the issues here. And it's a subject that I, I think it needs to be more evaluated. And uh, I sh really should say that's not what I advocate, but I sometimes do that. And I know from personal communications that very, uh, a lot of surgeons do that, but many people don't tell. And um, I, I would like to see uh, how the audience uh, 
manages these cases when there is no alternative IOL present uh, in, at the operating room. So we end up with a, with a four hepti single piece hydrophilic IOL surface. Uh, Philip, I will just uh, change to keynote screen. Okay. Okay. I would also ask if you could, I don't know if you're going to um, say it in your presentation, but if you could show us uh, the exact moment and freeze the frame where you noticed there was a tear. Yeah, uh, I, noticed, yeah. I noticed just at the end of the epinucleus aspiration. And uh, I, I couldn't see, even reviewing the video afterwards, when it, when uh, the exact moment it happened. You want, you want know? me to <laughs> May I launch the poll? Yes, yes, surely, Wallace. <laughs> Nathan, which IOL were you using in this case? I, uh, you're asking me? If you, uh, yeah. Uh, excuse me, yeah. Which one? Uh, I would like to, I'd like to, to see the poll first. Okay. <laughs> so as not to influence anything. I'm waiting a little bit, so we have 160, but everybody's voting. Okay. And uh, before it ends, I would like to know what's your, what do you think it will come? Yeah. For you and for our other presenters, how many would implant and how many wouldn't? I would. And what do you think will be the answer of, of the audience? Well, I'm I, I'm still here and I'm surprised. That I I I thought there would be much less people saying it would implant the single piece acrylic IOL in the circle because it's not a very a good thing. I don't think it's okay. And uh, most of the yeah. And let's wait. Let's wait. The, we're gonna we're gonna share the results, yeah. but there's people okay, still voting. Okay. Uh, I think I can share because uh, I think they stopped voting and it takes too long. So I'm going to share the results and then you can discuss. Okay. Can I comment on that? Sure. Uh, um, let's uh, first say that the surgery was really good. The only thing that I note and Dr. Neto also acknowledged it that he uh, went out from the AC without uh, putting viscoelastic to protect the posterior capsule uh, rupture from enlarging. Uh, but in terms of implanting the single piece IOL, and especially this one, this, this lens is perfect for this situation. Why? Because you have four uh, independent haptics. And I have done that numerous times uh, diagonal optic capture. You can take two of the haptics behind the anterior rexis and two of the haptics uh, in front of the anterior rexis. And you achieve uh, stable optic capture with this lens. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I have done that, this with uh, plate haptic like uh, Oculentis uh, Comfort and I cut the haptic in order to create four, uh, four uh, independent haptics in order to make diagonal optic capture. So this is a maneuver that can save a lot if you have intact rexis as in this case. Well, that's a very interesting technique you just described it, Dr. Lucan. And, uh, uh, I, I, I really don't think that two, two haptics, uh, the uh, single piece IOLs with two haptic, haptics are stable in the circles. And uh, even this one, as uh, the overall diameter is uh, really not uh, enough or sufficient to reach the circus, it, uh, this IOL in, 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 
in case has uh, 11 millimeter overall diameter, uh, uh, an IOL to reach the circles needs at least 13, uh, ideally 14 millimeters uh, in diameter. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to raise this question is uh, just to call attention to a problem that we are increasingly, increasingly having with a premium IOLs. And we really don't have a, an ideal or a premium optic IOL, be it uh, multifocal or toric, especially for circles implantation. And as we increasingly um, use more and more these IOLs, I think we're, uh, if something untoward happens in the surgery, we're in the opening. We're, we, we don't have any uh, alternative. Uh, if it's the first eye of the patient, you can opt to a three-piece single, uh, three-piece uh, foldable IOL, which is undoubtedly the best option when you have to do a sucus implantation. Uh, but if you, for example, it's the second eye where the other eye has an, an um, a modifocal IOL or even a torque correcting a significant amount of astigmatism. And the second eye, you will have not this possibility because uh, premium IOLs are not ideal to be placed in the circles. <laughs> if it's a toric patient, I think one of the things that I would, I end up doing in these cases is if I put a sulcus lens in, I'll increase the IOL power sufficiently. So let's say the patient has two diopters of corneal astigmatism. I want the post-op refraction to be plano minus two at the axis. Then after three months of healing, I can come back and do LASIK or PRK and, and right in. But with the multifocal, we don't have a good multifocal option. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Neto, uh, yeah. do you want to share your presentation? <clears throat> okay, no, just, just, uh... okay. There are two questions and we have to move for, for the next. Do you still have more uh, presentation, Neto, or? No, it's just a uh, uh, discussion. Just very, very, very and very fast i don't know if it's okay i'm 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 with the zoom screen over but uh, over the the presentation is it uh, running the 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 keynote in no 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 yeah. it's not it's not shared we're not sharing so there are two questions one is to look on if the diagonal uh, fixation doesn't cause tilt. Um, and the question is from Milton Yoji, uh, what is the take home message regarding the single piece IOL in Sokos? Because 25% of the people would implant it and 13% doesn't have a, a three piece IOL. What's your take home message, Neto? We know that Luca, gave his take home already, and uh, what's yours? Uh, I'm sorry, Wallace, I didn't hear it well. Uh, uh, so what is the take home message? Uh, should I oh. or should I not implant? No, I, know I, that I, I, don't, I, I think sh uh, uh, one should not implant the IOL. I, sh I think the best option is uh, to have uh, an alternative IOL in such cases. And uh, that's wh what I, uh, I do. I have a complete uh, inventory of three-piece IOLs in the room, right in the room, from 12 to 20 weight diopters, so that if something like that happens, I use. In this particular case, I was with a big gap in my inventory due to, to delivery problems, let's say. And um, 
maybe, or I think maybe the best option in this particular case would be to just close the eye and do a secondary implant later with one of that. But as Dr. Lucan uh, pointed out, and it's been my experience, with this kind of design with four haptic IOLs, it's a, it's a very stable. I think the, the problems that arise with this uh, kind of implant uh, are very few, but uh, I don't think it's the ideal uh, situation. Okay. I don't know we if are, this is running, if you're running in late on time. Uh, we, are, we are three minutes late. I just like, just for, okay. you, you can okay. finish it, but I would like to, to listen to the opinion of Dr. Devgan and Dr. Megu about this, because Dr. Devgan wrote here in the chat, but uh, I think it's good if everybody could listen to his opinion. Andy, I think it's important to differentiate what type of single piece acrylic lens it is. Two haptics, four haptics, hydrophobic, hydrophilic. In the US, the most commonly used single piece acrylic lenses probably 95% or more are the two haptic design, like the Alcon Aquasoft or the Techna Zibu or the Bauchlom and Vista that, that are hydrophobic and two haptics. And those ones, I don't think do uh, as well in the sulcus at all. So I don't encourage you to put those in. I agree with Dr. Neto, the best result here is gonna be a three piece lens, haptics in the sulcus and the optic captured behind the capsular rexus. That'll give you the best option. The other lenses that, uh, that Lucan was describing sounds great. I like your very innovative thinking as usual, but we don't have those IOLs in the USA. We're behind our international colleagues. What about you, Deepak? Yeah, uh, I, I must confess that I have used uh, hydrophilic lenses to be placed in the sulcus in the past in a situation where uh, I didn't have access to a multi-piece multi -piece lens at that particular moment. But uh, given a choice, there is no doubt that the multi-piece hydrophobic acrylic lens with the thin haptics are the best options available. The two reasons, the hydrophilic lenses, the, there's no issue as far as biocompatibility is concerned. The major issue is about the sizing of the lens, which is relatively much more shorter it is not more than 11.5 millimeter or 12 in major the cases. So the long-term centration is an issue. You can achieve this if you have four haptics and a smaller rexus for you to get an optic capture. But other than that, uh, it is going to be slightly difficult. So my uh, always uh, go-to lens would always be a multi-piece lens. Uh, in the worst case scenario, even if you don't have a lens in stock, Close the eye, as Dr. Nito said, and then we will uh, put it another day. Uh, we are eight minutes late, uh, but there's one question that many people ask, and that's for Lucan. Lucan, everybody's afraid that if you capture the IO the way that you proposed, you're going to have a tilt, and the tilt always generates astigmatism, uh, not coma, though. Uh, are you afraid of it? Are you worried about it? It's for Dr. Luca. No, uh, actually, these uh, lenses with four haptics, uh, you achieve a, a equal opposite capture of the uh, optic through the anterior rexis. So if you try this maneuver with uh, uh, um, two haptic C-loop lens, you are in danger to get tilt. If you have two haptics behind the rexis, two haptics on diagonal fashion, in front of the rexis, you achieve a parallel plane to the rexis. Of course, this is a maneuver intended for a, a monofocal aspheric lens, but not for, uh, um, for example, multifocal or something that uh, highly dependable, dependable from the centration. Uh, in, in USA, you have a BNL AO lens, which is with similar design. Uh, but still, it's a uh, aspheric lens with zero asphericity, so it can tolerate tolerate a little bit that centration. Let's move on, Tagushi. That's great, uh, Doctor Yude. 
Uh, I'd first like to thank you again for your presence. Dr. Iodei uh, runs his uh, most, uh, I think, most famous site, uh, The Cataract Coach, and also his channel on YouTube, as has been observed before. He usually posts uh, a lot of videos. And, well, uh, I, I have only to thank, uh, apart from being in this meeting, for running these resources, because I am pretty sure it has helped but many, many, many surgeons to uh, get better with their techniques and uh, thank you for FACO overall. Thank Dr. You. Uday, please, if you could share sure. um, your screen and videos. We'll do. Thank you, Felipe, Rafael, Wallace. A pleasure to be a participant in this uh, conference. Let me send you my link that should come up. That's the first video we're going to show. It's going to be my challenging case first. And I'll sh we'll learn from that. There you go. And then let's go to share my screen. Let's see if this works. And share. There we go. So here's this case. So something's different about this white cataract. And you can see when we look, it obviously is very an intumescent white cataract. And the key here is the history. The patient had a pars plane of vitrectomy one month prior. So filling the eye with the tripan blue, the scoelastic in, this part is routine, we'll get through it quickly. Now the key in this case, of course, is the rexus. And when we do this, we'll make our incision. Interestingly, I like to sit temporally for most of my cases. I know a lot of the other surgeons are sitting superiorly, but in the US, Temporal is more common. I like it because it's further away from the visual axis, and I think it gives me better um, access to the anterior chamber. And then also, that's where most of these elderly patients have their astigmatism. So making the incision here, when we poke in the capsule already, it's not normal. I try to poke in, it's actually quite difficult to poke into it. We finally get it started. Now, it's not because of zonules. Zonules are fine. We start our rexus here, and notice there's no fluid coming up. So that's a good giveaway. Another thing is the anterior lens capsule is not dome-shaped. It's sunken in a little bit. So again, the key is the history. The patient had a vitrectomy just about a month prior. And I knew there was going to be a problem here when I saw the patient in consultation, and I did the A scan to measure the axial length, and we'll show you that. So we get a nice looking rex here. Looks pretty good or appropriate size. Now certainly in this case, if you need to put a Saugus lens in, let's make sure we have that five millimeter rexus, which we do. And then in this case, don't need to do any hydro dissection. Don't need to do anything other than put the phago probe in the eye, but look what happens with that infusion pressure. Suddenly starts to look a lot deeper, and then we try to ask, and it's all gone. It's just gone. So certainly the issue here is look at that A scan. The posterior capsule's already open, and the lens material was already leaking into the vitreous cavity at the time of my pre-op consultation. That's the issue. So during the initial vitrectomy, the posterior capsule was inadvertently violated with the vitrector. And so now there's no chance of getting this up through the anterior segment, especially in an eye that's already had a vitrectomy. These lens material pieces fall back to the posterior segment very quickly. And so we can try clean up a little bit here. We'll clean up and put the lens in. Now, I actually knew this was going to happen, and we have our vitro-retinal colleague scrubbed in the surgery with me. I don't have the same skill sets as Luca gun does, anterior, posterior, anything he'll do. That's amazing. I'm very jealous. But for me, I'm just a cataract surgeon. I don't do vitro retinal surgery at all. And so I'll have to use my colleague who's going to help me, and he does only vitro retinal surgery. In the U.S., it's certainly in Los Angeles, in my part of town, it's very common for us to ultra-specialize. So my private clinic is actually no general ophthalmology at all. My clinic is only cataract surgery and refractive surgery. That's it. I don't ever check your visual field test. I send you out for that. 
And similarly, even for an intravitreal injection, I send you to a retina column. So cleaning up here, now we can see this is clearly a big violated posterior capsule. This patient will do fine with a sulcus lens, optic captured behind that rexus. So here's putting a little viscoelastic to open up the ciliary sulcus. I'm gonna use a three-piece acrylic lens here, monofocal. This patient is a little myopic and she wished to retain her myopia, which I can understand now that I'm presbyopic. So here comes the lens. Again, it's an acrylic lens. Now the eye is obviously very soft, unicameral eye, prior vitrectomy, and we'll deliver the lens here. And sometimes I like to deliver the lens on top of the iris initially, and then dial it in exactly where I want it. So instead of delivering it directly into the sulcus, I'll deliver it here, and then I can dial in the lens and get the haptics nicely secured and tuck the optic behind the capsorexis. Now there's a question earlier, what do you do with the lens calculations? In this case, with the optic being captured behind the capsorexis, it's about the same lens calculation as um, regular in the bag implantation. If the entire lens is in the sulcus, including the optics in the sulcus, then you need to adjust the IOL power down. And that's what I call my rule of nines. Zero to nine diopter IOL, no adjustment. Nine to 18, drop by half diopter. 18 to 27, drop by one diopter. And so there you go, there's the optic capture, and this will be very good for long-term stability. So you can see the rexus takes on that oval shape or the football shape. And now we'll suture up the incision. That little bit of a uh, lens capsule material that's behind the optic there, my retina colleague will get with the vitrector. Definitely suture the incision shut because he's gonna do a repeat part plane of vitrectomy. And so cut it, bury that. And then the, for the retinal part, we're gonna fast forward through that as well. But the usual small gauge vitrectomy, the lens material on this patient is relatively soft. It's not a very dense cataract. You can tell by the eyelashes here, this is a relatively young patient. This is not a, a very elderly patient. The cataract was primarily um, due to the vitrectomy and not from age-related nucleosclerosis. So here he's making a, a bigger opening here, bigger cautery area, because he thought he may have to put in a larger uh, gauge um, uh, lens fragmentome. But fortunately, this will just all come out with, the, with aspiration, you can see here. Again, this is my colleague operating. And so there you can see the evidence of the prior detachment and the laser that was done before. And then there's the lens material came out very quickly, very easily, and that looks pretty good. Again, this is shown at very great high speed, just so we can get through the case. The important case here, I think the very important take home message is to pay attention to these small clues. You can tell before surgery by the history, the tractomy, and then one month later, a white cataract. You can tell from the A scan, which showed the, the, the defect of the posterior capsule and the lens material going in the vitreous cavity. You can tell even by the slit lamp examination because the anterior lens capsule, instead of being domed forwards, it was sunken in. And so all these things are giveaway signs that the patient's going to have a very complicated course interop and you should prepare to do the vitrectomy like this. And I'm happy to say the patient did well and achieved a very nice outcome. Happy to open this up for discussion. Here's the very last end, cleaning up a little bit of those uh, capsule fragments to make sure it's nice and clean. All righty, so there's the end. Uh, let's. Let me close that and we can go back and I'll stop my screen sharing and open that for discussion. Uh, we have some uh, questions from the chat, but initially I would like to know uh, the opinion of the other uh, surgeons here. And there is one question that brings my attention. Uh, they're asking if uh, six uh, small incisions of cataract surgery or uh, 
for those who don't do it, uh, it's an extra cap like uh, would have been a better option in such cases uh, as the chamber fluctuation as said here in the question is, is yeah, I think SICS is not useful in this situation because it's a very soft nucleus and it's already partially in the vitreous cavity in a post vitrectomy eye. Any instruments going in the eye, especially when you make this large incision here, you're going to cause some pressure to have the nucleus, whatever's left of it, fall back. This patient was young, only about 50 years old. So SICS is, is needlessly making a large incision in this eye where you could have removed the entire lens through two paracentesis with just the vitrector. If I didn't need to put an eye well in the eye, the entire lens could have been removed with just a couple of small incisions. So no SICS, I think it'd be okay if the patient had a very dense cataract. But in this situation, I don't think it's entirely useful. There's a private message for me too. Yeah, in my I do a lot of other surgeries in my professor role. My week is split 50-50, half-time private clinic, only cataract refractive. Half the week I'm with my residents where I do glaucoma surgery, cornea surgery, gosh, even rarely strabismus surgery and eyelid surgery. But I never do parts plane of vitrectomy. So those I always farm out, I always send out. Dr. Neto, what's your opinion? importance of a good uh, capsular axis, a well-centered and uh, ideally sized capsular axis really um, gave the possibility of a good outcome because with the sulcus implantation and optic capture of the IOL, you get a stable IOL centered and uh, with a compartment compartment that's a hard one compartmentalizing the the eye and uh, so in these cases i think you cannot stress too much the importance of a good capsular axis so that it can save you afterwards excellent point there's another question about what type of anesthesia. So normal cases, every case is topical, tetracaine, a little bit of preservative-free lidocaine inside the anterior chamber, that's it. And systemically in the IV, they get one or two milligrams of midazolam, which is Versed. In this case, we knew there was going to be an issue. And my, my retina colleague was in the OR with me. So we did a retrobulbar block at the beginning of this case, because we knew ahead of time. If you're in a situation where you're doing cataract under topical, and you know there's a posterior capsule rupture or a complication, and you need to do an anterior vitrectomy, I tell my residents to add more anesthesia. That's a good time to get a retrobulbar going on the field, on the sterile field. Very important to make the patient comfortable. Deepak. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uday, I think that was a wonderful exhibition of uh, the, a case where uh, how to anticipate a situation. I think I agree with you that ACE can use a lot of clues. Uh, my one addition would be like whenever we see an intumescent lens or a white lens where the, con the convexity of the capsule is lost, when we look at the antechamber depth, that also gives us a clue. Invariably, I see whether it's because of trauma, the capsule, posterior capsule is open, or a post vitrectomy. The anterior depth invariably will be more than 3.5. So, when we look closely at the anterior depth in the A scan, if it is more than 3.5, that is an indirect evidence or it is a sign of caution for us to anticipate a pre existing posterior capsule tear. Uh, wonderful uh, tips, Dr. Uday. Excellent comment. I didn't bring that up, but you are correct. Thank you for teaching me. But you're, it makes a sense. If the AC is deep, four millimeters deep, like in this case, it's because of this situation. All right, let's go to my, my routine case. I'm going to pull this one up next. I'll send the link.
as Can well. Can you comment a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I want to comment this uh, from both points of view, uh, like from vitro retinal surgeon one and from cataract surgeon one. Uh, for example, we here, when we do a retinal surgery, uh, we always remove the lens on because of this uh, situation, because the retinal surgeon can damage the posterior uh, capsule and the cataract surgeon after him to uh, have issues like this one. Uh, the good thing was that you have your backup plan, you have perfect rexis and you have even your vitro retinal surgeon, surgeon in the OR. Uh, the good thing is, and the take home message is to know the habits and uh, the way of dealing of your vitro retinal surgeon. Because for example, I don't use uh, <clears throat> Fragmatone. I rise the nucleus with PFCL to AC and then I emulsify it with the um, FACO emulsifier. So in that scenario, the referring surgeon should not implant the lens. Mm -hmm. And if your uh, vitro retinal surgeon uh, uses a fragmaton, you uh, completely do the right thing because you ca compartmentalize the eye and you um, um, avoid additional uh, issues if uh, uh, vitreous remnants are present there. Excellent points, Lugan. Excellent. There are some more, some more questions here. Uh, they're asking if, uh, as the, the, the cortical matter was already liquefied, could it be managed by systemic steroids later? You're already there. You already have small gauge bimanual instruments. Just remove it. Okay. Uh, keep, keep the patient happy. Already the patient had to have another surgery that she wasn't anticipating, so. And did you see the, the, the biometry uh, before or after the surgery? Those before. before. I, I did the A-scan with my own hands. And you, and you already told the patient that she might, he or she might have a PC rupture? Correct. And I also told the patient that we're going to have your vitro retinal surgeon and me will do the surgery together. Yeah, I think I think we had a good point to anticipate and tell the patient everything that may happen. Uh, I think it's a good uh, good thing, right? Correct. All right. In the interest of time, we're going to make this next video fast, and I'm going to catch up. We'll finish right on time. Here is the link. Oh, let me send this to everyone. Send a link to everyone in meeting. There's that link. I think that went through. Try one more. There we go. And let me share my screen. All right. So this is just a routine case. But what was different here is this is a fellow ophthalmologist, a fellow cataract surgeon, no less. So the, the stress here is not, is not actually performing the surgery, it's me, it's the mental stress in doing the case. And this is pretty much a routine, average, normal case for me. Now, fortunately, this is just posterior subcapsular. This is not a posterior polar. If, a, if my fellow colleague from down the street had a posterior polar, whew, it'd make it even more stressful. So I started off by putting in preservative-free lidocaine. So this is 1% lidocaine preservative-free, but 50-50 with balanced salt solution. So it ends up being half percent. Here's the dispersive viscoelastic. This is viscote in this eye, getting a nice good wave and a good coating of that endothelium. I like diamond blades a lot. And so here's the diamond. We're using a 2.8 at the tip keratome. This patient has a little bit of sill at the steep axis where we're operating, which is against the rule. And then now, of course, you saw Dr. Neto also use similar forceps. A lot of us have these forceps that have marks on them, two and a half and five millimeters, which is, of course, the radius and the diameter of the ideal rexus. 
So here we're going to try for about a five to five and a half millimeter capsular rexus. And again, anesthesia here is just topical with that little bit of intracameral lidocaine as well as uh, IV anesthesia, intravenous of one or two milligrams of Versed. So there's the rexus and that looks pretty good. Notice the blood from the incisions. I like that. I like to barely nick the limbal vessel. That means great long-term stability and healing. So here's the hydrate, nice and gentle, watching for the fluid waves to go around. And one of the nice things about operating on a fellow ophthalmologist is lens calculations are very easy. All you do is you ask the, the patient, what do you want? <laughs> and that way he can't blame you later if it ends up being off a little bit. But here's the rotation. Now, a very, only a very little bit of, of rotation. I am going to try Dr. Rossitelli's spin technique as soon as we finish this virus stuff and I get back to the operating room. But I would love to learn that technique. I'm going to try that. But here's just a little bit of hydrodissection, a little bit of rotation. And here's the phaco tip. And again, we're using the purple sleeve because it's a 2 8 incision. And we made the 2 8 incision because the patient's sill is. Okay, let's finish this first. I'll, I'll get the questions at the end. So we'll go chop it in half. And you can see it's not a very dense cataract. Of course, if you yourself are an ophthalmologist, you probably won't wait until you have a brunescent or dense cataract. You'll probably want surgery sooner. So these pieces come up pretty easily. Not much, not much issue there, nice and soft. The key, of course, is that's not damage that poster capsule. So using that second hand, the chopper to really bring the pieces up. Again, not a difficult case. The stress for me is mostly mental. This, the patient was one of my mentors who taught me cataract surgery 20 years before. And so I have to be very careful. And so we'll take out our cataract pieces here, finishing this up nicely. And look at the chopper position. That's protecting the posterior capsule just in case. Take the instrument side of the eye and we'll clean up here. The surgeon here wanted just a monofocal lens aiming for, I believe, a little bit of myopia, which I'm very happy to, for me to be myopic now because of presbyopia. So cortex removal, let's speed this up a little faster. The rest of the case is pretty normal. So. And at the end here, monofocal lens, gonna go in the bag, polish the capsule, not going overboard. And the surgeon also, by the way, said, at the end of the surgery, I want a copy of the video. So when I need my cataract surgery, I'm coming down to Brazil though. And then the, here's removing viscoelastic. We planted the eye well with viscoelastic, with a cohesive viscoelastic in the eye. And so we have to go behind the eye well to remove it. And we can see the lens is nicely set it up, seal the incision. I do a very minimal amount of uh, stromal corneal hydration. And then I sweep the angle with BSS, make sure there's no retained viscoelastic. So let's end that sharing and let's go back. We can have a very brief discussion, but um, I want to catch us up on time. Dr. Deepak, do you want to hear your Yeah, we could move to Dr. Deepak. I want to thank you guys. It's a really big honor for me. First time I went to Brazil. And by the way, on the advertisement you sent out for the meeting, thank you for using my old picture from 15 years ago. I looked much younger, <laughs> thinner, no gray hair, more hair. But the first time I went to Brazil, that was the photo. It was 15 years ago, I was invited by Dr. Milton Yoji, and we had a fantastic time. And ever since then, I've always been very proud of my Brazilian colleagues, and I've learned a lot from you guys. We should thank you a lot for, for, for having uh, time to be with us here. It is a pleasure. And uh, we all hope that soon all this lockout ends, we will all meet in person, and we will um, cheer for our health. Thank you very much for your help. Uh, any other question, Taguchi, that we should ask him on, on the chat? 
And by the way, I'm still making videos. A lot of people have emailed me and asking me, why do I not, why are there no YouTube links, no new ones? I actually post the videos to YouTube in big batches, 10, 20 videos at a time. And then every day on cataractcoach.com, I release one video. So if you're watching them on YouTube directly, you're, you're, very, you're studying before the, the lesson. <laughs> That's great. Uh, for, for our next uh, videos, I would call Dr. Lukan if it is okay for Lukan and Deepak. Yeah, yeah. Lukan can go ahead. No problem. Okay. And while we are switching, uh, Dr. Deepak would you like to comment on Dr. Yode's technique. No, I just saw it was a wonderful demonstration. I the stress he demonstrated was more, I think, uh, just to keep us in good spirits. I think he did a wonderful job. Thank you, Vuday, for sharing your videos on YouTube. A lot to learn from you. Thank you. This is my video. Is it already shared? Yes. Do you see it? Yes, we see it. Okay, before I start, I can only add that uh, if you subscribe to Dr. Uday's channel, you will have a notification for every new video. You can catch up with the, uh, the production because this is like Hollywood. Perfect. <laughs> uh, so, uh, this is a regular case. Is it okay? You see it? Yeah. Uh, I normally do a two power synthesis and uh, <clears throat> I like to use uh, cohesive viscoelastic, which I put in the eye before I make the corneal incision because uh, now the eye is firm and uh, the incision I think is more uh, good and uh, well formed. Um, I use 2.2 keratom, uh, limbo incision. Uh, this is the rexis. And this is a regular cortical cataract. So everyday surgery. The plan is to use uh, monofocal single piece acrylic IOL from BNL, which is IDEA. I don't know if you know that model. Uh, and it is pretty good for hydro implantation. Now I like to do the hydro dissection through the main incision. That way, uh, viscoelastic can escape and I do, do not uh, create uh, over pressure in the AC. Uh, I'm using a balance tip from Centurion, but on Constellation machine, my technique is uh, like opposite chop. It is a modification of the horizontal chop and I like to reach under the capsule and to chop the pieces with uh, actual less vacuum and fluidic energy because my settings are like uh, vacuum 280, flow rate fixed 14 and um, one 100 millimeters of um, bottle height. I use only torsional without longitudinal. And this is the surgery. Um, I divide uh, normally on four pieces and then chop them piece by piece and eat them like that. I like low fluid settings because the total amount of fluid which passed through the eye is less and on the next day the cornea is clear. Now this is the end of the emulsification. I use bimineal INA because I think the control is better and uh, I can reach every spot in the 
anterior chamber, especially under the main incision, which is sometimes difficult with coaxial uh, irrigation aspiration. I like uh, to have flat aspiration, that way I cannot uh, um, unintentionally uh, grab the capsule, especially the posterior one. This is the cortex coming out. And now the implantation. As Dr. Neto showed the technique, it's fairly simple. There is uh, really less viscoelastic in the AC. And now, hydro, uh, hydration wounds. So that's it, my first case, regular surgery. Uh, Dr. Pilkan, is that yes. uh, IOL, the one you mentioned, you could uh, cut the haptics? No, uh, this is not the one. Uh, I meant a plate haptic lens, which is uh, from okay. oculate lenses, yeah. yeah. So. Beautiful survey, Lugan. Thank you, thank you, Professor Lugan. Dr. Neto, would you like to? I think this is the first time I see someone do uh, placing uh, OVD before the incision. And I like the comment of Dr. Um, uh, Uday, saying that he likes the blood. It reminds me of my partner and the excellent surgeon, Dr. Edson Mori. He likes the blood too. Just a, just a little bit. If the incision is 100% avascular, then it's like a LASIK flap. Ten years later, you can just open it right up. Uh, what I would add is that I, I concur with uh, Dr. Yude that I'm really envy of Dr. Lucan for being a, also a posterior segment surgeon. I think that must give him a, a really great peace of mind. <laughs> I really would like to be one. Excellent case and, and, and surgery. Congratulations, Lucan. Very beautiful surgery. And Dr. I, I follow you. I eagerly follow your channel. <laughs> Dr. Lucan, uh, people from the chat are asking, uh, what chopper do you use? Uh, the chopper actually is my design created one year ago and uh, uh, there is a there is a, a my friends from the audience now one is professor milton yoji the other one is uh, gustavo Huning, which are uh, have experience uh, real life experience with this chopper because i sent it to them and uh, probably they can share some thoughts about it. I like it because it's safe and I can reach everywhere. And as you noticed, I am, um, I'm not paying attention where I'm going with the chopper because that's not harmful for the capsule. Can we, can we bring uh, Professor Yoji to comment of if it is here? Sure, Milton. Do you like to comment? And Gustavo also, Gustavo just wrote on the chat saying that the shopper is great. Dr. Muta, I think you're muted. Uh, 
I think your your mic isn't Hello? working. Hello, uh, Dr. Gustavo. Hello, Professor Milton. Before, please. Uh, I think he has some uh, mic issues. If you would like to start. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Thank the space and congratulations for the organization. It's outstanding. Just great surgeons. You are all the my inspiration, guys. Uh, to be very brief, um, Dr. Mishev Chopper is amazing, and the greatest thing about it, in my opinion, it is because it has no sharp sides. It's really difficult to have a posterior capsule rupture with it while, you, while you're doing your phaco, okay? And if you're able to put it on the equator, you're going to chop it really, really easy. I do recommend it, and... I don't know if he's already selling them. I tried to buy them, but he didn't let me. I strongly recommend it. Good luck, guys. Nice talk. Uh, are you listening to me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to chime in. Uh, congratulations, Luca. I, I, I want uh, to... Uh, tell my colleagues that Lucan is a, a geek, fake or nerd. Hmm. He is, uh, he tries uh, with technology. He's a Nuber geek. Uh, he has, he uses professional cameras, professional I mean uh, cinematography cameras in order to record videos. Uh, I used to talk to him about these aspects and I, Obviously, I, I learned from him. The other uh, aspect he is very knowledgeable about is the premium IOLs that are offered in uh, Europe, and uh, we don't have access uh, to these platforms in uh, Americas. So I learned a lot from him. Uh, and regarding the shopper, uh, uh, I had uh, the opportunity to use uh, it when he was uh, in his early prototypes. And it's a very, very clever design as Gustavo stressed it out. It has an angled uh, tip and it ha has a very polished uh, design. So it offers no danger to co posterior capsule and uh, and I use it a lot. Uh, I think mine was produced by Epsilon, uh, but I don't know uh, currently how, how it is uh, in the market, if it's the same uh, manufacturer. Thank you, Milton. It's always a pleasure having you here. Good. I put a poll here just to help us to know where you're coming from, uh, but uh, while the poll is going on, I would like to ask Lucan to show his second video, please. So is it on the screen now? Yes. Okay. This is a case of posterior power cataract. Um, which I approached routinely, and the idea was to implant the uh, EDOF lens uh, called uh, Synthesis Plus, which is for haptic design. And uh, exactly because, uh, exactly uh, if when I anticipate some incident with the posterior uh, capsule, I choose for haptic design lens uh, because. I can diagonally fix it to the uh, anterior axis. So here again, routine axis. And uh, I think the key thing with posterior power cataracts is to have a good anterior axis, as Dr. Neto pointed out, this can save the day later if we have issues with the capsule. Uh, now, opposed to uh, the common opinion, I do like to make gentle um, hydrodissection, not hydrodilineation, 
because I think that there is no more gentle thing than the thin fluid wave to dissect around or to dissect the posterior plate. In my opinion, 90% uh, of the posterior polar cataracts, they're between the posterior plane and uh, often are not attached to the immature posterior capsule. So uh, if one uh, is careful enough, it can be really done well. Now, the other thing is that I don't rotate at all after the gentle uh, hydro dissection because the rotation can open up the thin capsule because the pressure that we can induce with the uh, chopper can open it up. Uh, up. Uh, again, low vacuum settings, avoiding fluid waves and the high pressure in the AC. And obviously this is really soft lens. Now again, by manual INA. In this particular case, uh, and in our normal practice, we use only topical anesthesia and intravenous uh, uh, sedation. Uh, but here the patient is a little bit tense. Now I will try to peel that black, black there. Here you can see how the patient moves. So in such cases, the presence of anesthesiologists is priceless. Now, after cleaning the periphery, I will try to peel that posterior plate. This is where my heart beats very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> Now here you see the opening of the posterior capsule uh, where I realized that I should do something more than just implant the lens. Now I will go out only with the aspiration and ask my colleague to bring me the cohesive visco syringe. I will fill the AC and then I will go out because the situation turns like in a uh, child case, how we can perform a posterior rexis. I put cohesive visco elastic in Berger space to delineate the vitreous from the capsule. And I decided to create posterior opening of the capsule. Metal cell rolls over the cornea for, for better visualization and for taking a few breaths because entering the eye. Here normally my heart stops beating.
Dr. Lucan, do you have any comments on how to do a posterior uh, rexis? Because it's quite different from the anterior, right? Yeah, the main, uh, I think the most important thing is that you do not need to overfill the anterior chamber and to uh, overstretch the capsule with OVD. So you aim for firm eye. You do not overfill it because it will alter the direction of the rexis. So this is my posterior rexis here. It's fairly centered. Now I will put additional viscoelastic before the implantation to open the capsule. Uh, it is really important the surgeon to load the lens now because any issues with loading will compromise the end result and to control the uh, loading under microscope to be sure that everything is fine. Now I like to place the spatula under the lens in order to prevent engaging the posterior hole of the capsule. This is the synthesis EDOF lens. four haptics. Now, when I implant it in the back, you will see how one mark of the lens engaged the posterior rexis. Mm. Another critical moment for my heart. <laughs> and I was surprised that with a gentle spatula movement, I can relieve that without causing tearing of the posterior rexis. So this is the end result. This is the irrigation inspiration. The important thing to note here is to reduce the bottle height because if you observe carefully, there will be uh, two moments where uh, all the diaphragm uh, pops back, like increased uh, pressure inside the eye. Uh, oh, here it is. So, reduced fluidics. No vitreous lost, well centered lens. Beautiful surgery, and now the patient will never need a YAG capsulotomy. <laughs> indeed, indeed, yes. And this is the end of the, the case. Dr. Lucan, we have some questions from the chat. Uh, yeah. First of all, beautiful surgery, congratulations. And uh, they're asking if, do you try uh, viscodissecting uh, these cases mm -hmm. as well? Uh, and if, in this case, in particular, there wasn't uh, any signs of uh, posterior capsular rupture before uh, the surgery. But if uh, you think there is a rupture before the surgery, would you even then uh, try to gently manipulate or gently hydrodesiccate or viscodesiccate these, these, these kind of nucleus? In my personal experience and opinion, I would only use gentle fluid wave because uh, viscoelastic, no matter dispersive or cohesive, uh, it increases the volume a lot. And uh, to answer the question, I would not do uh, viscodissection in such case. Uh, on the second question, probably as you pointed out, I'm privileged to be a pole-to-pole uh, -pole surgeon. So for me, it doesn't matter if, if the uh, posterior capsule opens up, I will uh, deal it with the posterior wave. But the most important thing in such cases is to make a good capsule or axis to save your day later. Dr. Luca. Great. 
that was wonderful exhibition of the surgery and also we did the posterior capsular access very very really well uh, one small query would you prefer a dispersive ovd or a cohesive ovd uh, to inject under the posterior capsule in the burgers space what's your choice of ovd uh, just before doing the access i i always use a cohesive ovd because i need space maintenance not covering the, the tissues, I need to open the space. And I didn't saw any uh, IOP late issues uh, with leaving the cohesive OVD in the posterior chamber or behind the capsule. Great. Okay, so okay. Dr. De Dr. Devgan, you're gonna have your cataract done here. I'm going to Bulgaria. I'm going to do one eye in Brazil and one eye in Bulgaria. <laughs> but the, and then we'll go to, to, uh, to India. <laughs> Can I go to Brazil uh, and we all go there and resolve the case? <laughs> all cases. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lucan, there are two more questions here from the chat. And uh, do you always, um, I, I don't like this word as always, but do you usually? polish the posterior capsule uh, in these cases or and also when do you leave if ever uh, these cases for EI capsulotomy after in this particular case the white plaque was significant and uh, the lens uh, which was chosen here is EDOF so it's a little bit uh, uh, surgery that requires good outcome uh, or I wouldn't advise on every case like this to make a posterior rexis if we know that with the uh, YAC laser we can handle that. Uh, you know the rule, primum non nocere. If you are not sure that you will go going to make successful posterior capsule rexis, leave it to the YAC laser. And do you aspirate the viscoelastic behind the IOL? No, no, no. In this condition, I, I'm afraid to go back because if you pull the anterior higher width, it will mess all the efforts. Great, great, nice surgery. I think we can move, uh, move on. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, Dr. Homolo uh, is asking if you have some tips for red heart cataract associated with a posterior polar. I think that's uh, usually found in me. Red heart cataracts. Uh, yes, uh, I think he implies to this type of cataracts where they have function like 0 0.4 or 5. And when you touch the nucleus, it is like Brunescent cataract. Uh, actually, my only advice is to have a vitreo retinal surgeon near you or to have a good friend near a vitreo retinal surgeon. Or being a good retinal surgeon as well. <laughs> if you be, yeah. Congratulations once again, Dr. Lucan. Uh, Dr. Deepak, would you like to share your views? Dr. Deepak is a great. Uh, friend uh, from India, is a brilliant surgeon. I think you're muted, Dr. Deepak. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I maybe on. try to share your screen. So if if the video gets uh, too choppy, uh, Rafael is ready to to reproduce it if needed. Yeah, sure. So I'll be sharing a case uh, which I experienced about a few years back. It was 2017. I think this case is a, uh, I'm starting it just after Dr. Lucan's postipolar cataract because my case also is the same. Uh, this is a case, the experience which I had, I have never seen in my hands or I have never seen with anybody else so far. So it was a great learning experience. Most complications do teach us more than the routine ones. So I'm sharing the uh, case which I had a complication which was first of its kind for me. So just let's go through the, 
video and this video has uh, the audio also options for so, training and education if there is any issues please let me know I just think uh, your screen isn't shared, uh, Dr. Deepak. Just a second. Is it shared now? Yes. Okay. Your discretion is strongly recommended. So this was back in 2017. We had uh, this experience and... Uh, the title is How Early Can a PC Tear Happen? And this was uh, a unique experience for me. I don't, I didn't see anything like this before. I, I don't know, I'm not sure whether you have. Just let's have a look at this case. Uh, this male patient who's having a posterior polar cataract. Uh, he has a classical onion peel appearance. And uh, interestingly, the biometry shows a very deep chamber of 4.62 millimeters and an axial length of 26 millimeter. So let's begin the case. The surgery is being done under posterior subtenance anesthesia. So after making the two side port incisions, I stain the anti-capsule and I'm using uh, initially a dispersive OVD followed by cohesive OVD for the classical soft shell technique. And as I'm introducing the OVD, I suddenly see something unusual happening here. When we go back and see the replay, the posterior plaque just expanded during the injection of the OVD. This was something very unusual and clearly suggestive of a potentially an open posterior capsule now. So my plan was to assume that the posterior capsule was ruptured, although it was not very clearly evident. And all my subsequent strategies has to be taken with this uh, consideration. So the rex's sizing and centration was the most important thing because I would want to uh, have an optic capture because the PC was probably be uh, defective in this case. So I'm aiming at a well-centered four and a half to five millimeter axis, which could be achieved quite easily. I'm not performing any hydro dissection. I'm using a blunt iris spatula to perform a sort of an hydrofree dissection. And then I directly proceed to sculpt the central nucleus using I'm not very low flow rate, a low bottle height, and low vacuum, low power. My idea is to perform an inside out hydrodelineation as has been popularized by Dr. Vasavada. Once I achieve the, the hydrodelineation ring, I'm separating the two heminucleus and without any rotation of any of the fragments. Each of these fragments is emulsified using the slow motion technique as has been described by Dr. Osher using low parameters, low bottle height and a low bar. The emulsification of the nucleus is not at all an issue here because it's extremely soft and each of the two M nucleus pieces are emulsified. Now before I am trying to engage the epinucleus and trying to uh, consume the epinucleus but the small size of rexus is restricting the easy accessibility of this epinucleus. Once I have trimmed the distal part of the epinucleus uh, before removing my FACO handpiece uh, to prevent AC from shallowing, I'm introducing another handpiece uh, with irrigating fluid so that the chamber is maintained throughout. Now I'm using dispersive OVD. The idea is to perform viscodissection so that the epinucleus is pushed into the pupillary plane. And at the same time, the dispersive OVD also provides a sort of a barrier and a tamponading effect uh, for the posterior capsular tear, which is presumably present behind. As I'm aspirating the cortex, uh, the first time I notice the, the possibility of a PCTA here. 
I can see a defect which looks very much like a post capsular defect. And again, at this moment, I stop the procedure and go back and inject a dispersive OVD just to ensure that the defect is adequately plugged by the dispersive OVD. At the same time, the epinucleus is pushed a little bit more anteriorly. Uh, again, the wide split in the posterior capsule is very much evident. And again, I go back, use my dispersive OVD to plug it. And once it is done, the remaining uh, part of the epinucleus is gently maneuvered uh, into the pupillary zone and again aspirated by my phaco handpiece. And there's no vitreous prolapse at this moment. I need to go back and remove a little bit of the cortex which is there. Again, the cortex is being aspirated using extremely low uh, bottle height and low parameters. Uh, care is taken that there is no fluctuation in the entry chamber. Once all of the cortex is removed, I'm wondering whether to do antivitrectomy or not because at present, the antihalot phase doesn't seem to be disturbed. But however, I see few of the lens uh, fibers uh, in the antivitreous, so I decide to go ahead and perform a limited bimanual antivitrectomy. Uh, after just doing a limited antivitrectomy, <coughs> clear off a little bit of a lens debris which were there, the plan is to put a multi-piece lens into the sulcus. Uh, this is a hydrophobic acrylic multi-piece lens and we're placing into the sulcus. The lens is then gently dialed. Now I go again with my vitrector to remove the OVD which is gone behind the lens into the vitreous cavity. Uh, once the OVD behind the lens is removed, now is the time to achieve the optic capture. With the irrigating handpiece in my left hand, I gently nudge the optic behind the rexus margin using the lens dialer. The rexus becomes oval. The ovalization of the rexus is a indicator of the perfect optic capture which has been achieved with the haptics being in sulcus and optic behind uh, the rexus margin. I'm confirming the absence of vitreous by using a transition estate for one last time. Diluted uh, pilocarpine is used to consider the pupil and eventually the case state, well, these are the eye looks post-operatively. On dilated examination, we can clearly see that the lens is uh, extremely well-centered and is well trapped behind the rexus margin. So what did we learn from this case? This case demonstrated a very rare phenomenon of rupture of the posterior capsule in a case of posterior polar cataract uh, because of increased hydrostatic pressure inside the eye, even before the rexus could be performed. Lessons to learn here is that although maintaining an antechamber depth is critical, Overinflating the chamber can be deleterious to the pathological posterior capsule in a posterior polar cataract. Maintaining the antechamber equilibrium throughout the procedure is critical. However, over deepening or sudden shallowing are to be avoided in such eyes. I think uh, that's it. it. Beautiful recovery. I have never seen a case like that in my entire life. Yeah. Beautiful outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let's ask uh, any other surgeon, ha have you ever experienced something like that? Like uh, seeing, seeing it rupture like, uh, live, right? Even rexus, even before the rexus is completed. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Milton pointed out in the chat that uh, the parameters uh, were that were used. Uh, it it requires a lot of uh, effort to adjust these parameters so everything can be done uh, perfectly as you showed in the video. I would ask which uh, which FACO machine were you using and at what parameters? Uh, I was using Infinity uh, when this uh, when I was operating on this case. Uh, I did use a bottle height of about uh, 
say 70 centimeters when I was operating uh, for nucleus management. But now my understanding is such that, you know, I would prefer still lower road bottle height. Even if you're using a gravity-based machine, not like a uh, Centurion where it is, uh, the fluidics is active, still I think lowering the infusion is an extremely important step uh, when you're managing posterior polar cataracts, especially in younger patients and patients who are myopes. The reason I'm saying is, you know, whenever these young patients are myopes, the scleral rigidity is a factor. It stretches and that's the reason why the there's no way the fluid comes out. That is the reason why the posterior capsule tear happened here in the first instance. The patient was a myope, although he was a 50-year-old myope, but it could happen only because the scleral rigidity or lack of it causes excessive accumulation of fluid. It doesn't go out. Uh, and that's the reason we have a raise in the hydrostatic pressure inside the eye. That's the reason why the weak posterior capsule gives way. Even in situation where we have a posterior capsule tear and we don't have uh, yet have an anterior tear, the reason how we can prevent an anterior rupture is if we can maintain the uh, chamber pressure to a lower level and at the same time not uh, you know, sacrificing the uh, fluctuation of chamber. The chamber has to be rock solid, but doesn't mean it has to be very deep. So over inflating the chamber can also rupture an intact anterior highlight. So if we can understand this basic principle of you know maintaining the chamber rather than over pressurizing it or or uh, unduly shallowing it, uh, maintaining a status quo like in in respect to the posterior capsule or the anterior hyoid, most of the time we can get away uh, without rupturing the anterior hyoid even in presence of a, a posterior capsule tear. As we saw in this case, the anterior hyoid had not ruptured. Given a chance now, if I had to operate today, I would not have ventured doing an anterior vitrectomy. I would have left the OVD and a little bits of lens matter there. I would have just put a lens and uh, uh, come out. So it's an in hindsight. In hindsight, always the things are much more clearer. But given a second chance, I would how would I have done differently was this. And obviously, you know, this was a case where over inflating an eye, especially in an eye which has got a, a pathological posterior capsule in younger patients and in myopes shouldn't be done okay you always err on the eye being slightly softer or uh, on, on the normal side rather than keeping a harder eye it's not justifiable to keep a slightly over pressurized eye in these vulnerable cases great uh, there's another question here about the orientation of the haptics uh, when you have a posterior capsular rupture the uh, where is uh, or if is there one uh, position uh, for the haptics to go either if you choose I think we can expand this question so uh, for like single piece IOLs in the bag or for three piece IOLs in the sulcus is there a preferential uh, positioning of these haptics if you have a posterior capsule tear and I think the first choice always is going to be a multi-piece lens uh, in this case, the sizing of the rexus is important. We want to lock the lens into the rexus. So if you are able to achieve, get a good lock in of the lens, if you have a right sized rexus, I don't think uh, the orientation of the haptics matters. What is critical here is you want to ensure that the optic is behind the uh, rexus so that it is locked and this ensures a long-term centration. Now coming, you want to place a lens inside the bag. Well, if a single piece lens, this, the question probably is indicated that what you do when you're uh, dealing with an extra large bag as in myopes. So maybe in those situations, I would prefer to place it in a horizontal meridian uh, just to ensure that, you know, you that is slightly longer. That is a reason why. But in the case of a posterior capsule tear and you're putting a lens in the sulcus, I think the sizing of the rexus is very critical so that we have uh, 360 degrees of optic capture. That is very critical. Uh, that's the last question here from the chat. If uh, this case faces a surgeon with short experience, what would you be your advice? Well, uh, it's a tough question. <laughs> uh, because this was my first experience. I hadn't had any, any experience like this. But uh, I think, you know, you need to be, uh, first important thing is you need to diagnose the PC tear early. 
most inexperienced surgeons, I doubt whether they would have diagnosed this PC tear as early. They, it was, they would have just overlooked it. That is the first impression which I, if I had done 10 years back, I would have overlooked that PC tear wouldn't be visible for me. So I couldn't have formulated anything. So you just go ahead and uh, you do the routine surgery and the lens would have dropped. So the first thing I think would be the critical thing would be to diagnose the PC tear early. Mind you, with an underlying nucleus, it's extremely difficult to diagnose a PC tear uh, unless and until you are very focused in anticipating these things. If you are able to diagnose it, then if you have a backup support, if you're a beginner surgeon, if you have a backup support, I definitely would uh, recommend to just have a backup. And if you have already diagnosed it, it all depends upon your experience and skill level and uh, your anticipation of the problem. Uh, Dr. Muto, would you like to yes. Dr. Muto would like to make a comment. Uh, yes. Uh... One of the aspects I, I see in your surgery, a superb surgery, is what I call an elegance. The elegance of uh, mastering the parameters beforehand. Uh, one has to have a great knowledge of the reaction of the equipment. So it's, in, it's very interesting that uh, you are also aware of this because you showed uh, your parameters in the video as well, just to stress out how important are the perfect adjustments of the parameters in order to do what you want to do. Uh, so many surgeons are reactive more than proactive. They go by trial, trial and error. So they enter the, the eye, they do some maneuver, and then see the reaction that happens with that fluidics, for example. Uh, but you do uh, the opposite. You first you adjust your parameters and understand what the reaction will be. And then you enter the eye and uh, the things start happening as you have planned. So, this kind of uh, uh, knowledge in terms of dealing with parameters is what I think is ultimately the elegance. Congratulations. Thank you so much for your kind words, sir. And uh, I think we need to remember that there is nothing like one size fits all. Uh, you need to be well versed with knowing your machine and to adjust your parameters as the situation demands. Because, uh, and the mind has to be trained to uh, anticipate problems and be ready because whenever we have an unexpected complication, the stress level ensures that our efficiency level goes down dramatically. So we are not in a position to take proper decisions. So unless and until we are mentally prepared and it's like an exercise, you, are, you exercise yourself to be ready to face the, the worst case scenarios. And if you're mentally prepared and well aware of the circumstances, then probably you can fine tune it. Otherwise, it becomes, you know, in a panic situation, things can go really spiral down a little bit. Great. Uh, Dr. Deepak, may we move on for your uh, next case? And while we're doing it, uh, there are some questions also from the chat. Uh, one of them is, why didn't you position the IOL haptics perpendicular to the rupture direction? Uh, since the, the lens was being placed, the haptics are in the sulcus and the opti only the optic is going behind the uh, rexus margin. So it is immaterial whether where you want to orient. Unless and until you want to place the lens inside the bag, that's the situation where you are going to orient the haptics perpendicular to the, uh, the, your direction of a PC tear. And because the equatorial tear was equator to equator, I wasn't interested in placing the lens in the back. So the idea was placing the lens in the sulcus and then achieving an optic capture. So in this scenario, orientation of the haptic is, uh, doesn't matter so much. Great. Uh, could you share your next video, please, Dr. Deepak? Sure. Hello, I'll be presenting this case, which demonstrates the routine steps on my way of doing cataract surgery. 
Now, this is a 90-year-old lady with a dense cataract. The surgery is being done under topical anesthesia with some amount of supplementation uh, using a subconjunctival acid. After making this eye port, so I'm staining with Trapan Blue. Visualization is challenging with these brown and black cataracts as there's a limited uh, contrast. I'm using dispersive OVD, which is a mix of chondritin sulfate and sodium halides. The main 2.8 millimeter incision is created by stabilizing the globe with a second instrument to the side foot and a 2.8 millimeter bevel of sharp keratone. My preferred incision is always a posterior limbal incision as I find them safer, stable, and faster to heal. Moving on to the rexus, I'm using forceps to do the rexus. In such cases where the nucleus is hard and bulky, I aim to perform rexus, which is not less than five millimeter. Having an adequately large rexus makes life relatively easier during nucleus division and management. Once the rexus is done, hydrodissection uh, is performed with uh, the bare minimum amount of fluid, followed by a decompression to let out the trapped fluid. The nucleus is gently rotated to ensure that there are no corticocapsular adhesions. My strategy for nucleus management is to do a direct job for this case. Before starting, I prefer to make a small central trench so that I can bury my phaco tip in a much deeper plane and I can get a firmer uh, grip. I prefer to stabilize the nucleus with my chopper during trenching. I aim to perform a trench which is about 60% deep. Now I switch to my FACO chop settings. I'm just using longitudinal power in burst mode. I'm burying the tip into the nucleus until the entire tip is submerged into the substance of the nucleus. Then the sharp chopper moves down vertically and then laterally. The lateral separation maneuvers will be repeated at progressively deeper planes so that they, as this is a denser cataract. Once the posterior plate is cracked, I move on to create the next chop. Again, similar maneuvers, bury, vertical chop, and then lateral separation. Now, for a moment, let me talk about my settings. And during chopping maneuvers, I don't use torsion ultrasound. I prefer longitudinal only uh, because we get better hold and grip, which is critical for chopping. And because torsional has excellent cutting ability, I use it during uh, cotton removal and sculpting. After the third chop, I'm getting one of the quadrant out of the bag and then consuming it. The idea is to create some space in the bag, which is helpful in such cases in which the nucleus invariably would be large and bulky. And the chopping is continued in a similar fashion until I have many smaller fragments which are easier to consume. One of the primary concerns while dealing with such cases is the corneal endothelium. Two factors are critical which predict the amount of endothelial damage during emulsification. The amount of turbulence generated inside the interchamber and also the plane of emulsification. These are the two critical factors which decide how clear the cornea is going to be on the first post-op day. It's mandatory for us to ensure that the plane of emulsification is at the level of the rexus or at the level of the iris. To control turbulence, we must always have just the right amount of power coupled with the appropriate flow rate and vacuum for that particular machine so that all the small fragments are emulsified in a very controlled manner without any of the fragments flying around and hitting the endothelium. So one prerequisite would be to use adequate amount of appropriate OVD. I prefer to use the dispersive OVD on top followed by HPMC underneath. It is some sort of a modified soft shell technique, if I may call it so. Dispersive OVDs like the Viscoat, etc. can be thermogenic. 
That is, it can produce a lot of heat. I prefer to place it much near the endothelium. And methyl cellulose is placed under it. That is, at the level of the rexus and into the capsule bag, which is where the phago tip would be and the heat would be generated. So finally, the last fragment is emulsified. Wound burn will also be a concern, but not so much with torsional though. But I usually ask my assistant to keep pouring BSS on the region of the incision. The cortex is then aspirated out. Finally, it's time for the lens to be implanted. I'm using the hydro implantation technique to place the lens into the bag in this case. The remaining OVD is removed. Side ports are hydrated carefully. The elderly people are vulnerable for desperate attachment, so we need to be aware of that and be a little bit cautious during hydration. That's it. Thank you for your attention. I think that's it. Uh, my case is done. That's great, Dr. Deepak. Um, there's uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, has raised his hand. Would you like to... Would you like to, to, to make a question, Dr. Ahmed? Or was it unintentional as well? No, it's um, intentional. I think. Thank you very much for your video and sharing the ideas. Uh, this kind of cataract with a uh, dense cataract are very common in our local area in the Middle East. And I definitely do, do not recommend to do uh, phaco emulsification using this, uh, the uh, infinity machine. I do recommend using a centurion or ferrous machine for such high dense cataract because of the post operative uh, corneal edema. And also, do advise to use a 3% sodium hyaluronate for the better endothelial protection. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your suggestions. I'd like to, to, to hear the comments of uh, the other speakers. I know Rosatelle is also very experienced in very dense cataracts, and I'm sure all of you are. Let's, let's learn. Well, a masterful management of this challenging case, Dr. Zipa. I, I would like to, to call attention that these cases, it's very, in these cases, it's very important to maintain, maintain OVD protection of the endothelium as he did. And one of the things that can help uh, um, the surgeon to evaluate when to refill the anterior chamber, stop emulsifying the, the, the nucleus and refill the anterior chamber, is the sentinel bubble sign. And uh, if you have small bubbles just lying under the endothelium, you can sort of have a good idea if uh, it is, uh, there is OVD leverage happening by the behavior of these bubbles. And when these bubbles are washed out, it uh, can be a sign that the OVD is also being washed out and you should stop and refill. And uh, in the surgery, uh, I could observe that and Dr. Deepak really uh, refilled, uh, refilled the anterior chamber at the exact time when this happened. And this can be very helpful to beginner surgeons to evaluate if there is uh, too much OVD being washed out from the anterior chamber. And uh, this, uh, once again, Dr. Zipak Megur showed his uh, masterful management of phaco parameters in this surgery. Thank you. I think no, the OVD use cannot be you know, uh, overemphasized because 
at every stage we need to remember that uh, the coronal endothelial cells are priceless and no amount of uh, expenditure spent on ovd can be you know justified so uh, don't be hesitant to use ovd i think they really are life savers for us in such situations deepak beautiful surgery i liked it very much my favorite Thank part you. of your surgery was making the initial trench at the beginning in order to get the phaco probe deeper within the nucleus before you chop that was masterful thank you i uh, i just going back to your comment on uh, liking a little bit of blood my incision as you saw is much more beyond the limbus actually yeah. so it is almost you can say a little bit of a spiral type especially people who are using uh, longitudinal only phaco energy you know it's better to err slightly on the spiral side because sclera is much more forgiving than cornea as far as the cornea burns are concerned so uh, uh, this my incision is always posterior limbal immaterial whether i'm doing a soft cataract or a hard cataract but uh, in generally you, the whenever we we have a posterior limbal incisions they heal much faster the patients are much comfortable so that is my go to incision uh, in the surgery when you doing surgery it may look very less elegant lot of blood coming out and all but still you know at the end of the day i is still my go to incision in all my cases Great. Uh, there's a question from the chat. Uh, Dr. Deepak, is there any situation that you don't do hydrodissection on these brown hard nuclei? Uh, thank you for the question. I think it's a relevant question because uh, is there a need for doing hydrodissection, especially because we, don't, we know that in most of these brown cataracts, there's hardly any uh, um, uh, cortex there or epinucleus there. Do we need to do it? well i think there is you know you also need to anticipate that in elderly patients you also have a little bit of a zonular weakness so even though you don't want the uh, do hydrodissection uh, because there is no attachment to the cortex with the capsule but it gives us an assessment of you know what is the zonular status so i always would want to ensure even using the very little amount of fluid to do hydrodissection it gives gives us an idea like you know whether the nucleus is truly mobile or not so that is uh, i uh, whether it's required or not it's still go ahead and do hydrodissection but you need to be careful that the amount of fluid which you're using is very minimal because the bag the uh, there is not much space inside the bag so that's the reason you need to use very little amount of fluid and typically if you would want you want to use small amount of fluid at multiple quadrants uh, and then always decompress so that you don't want the pressure to build inside and the situation where the post capsule can blow away Uh, Dr. Hafa, I was asking if you remember the CDE in the end of the surgery. Uh, I, we had done a, a, a specular pre-op. It was around 1800, and uh, it was quite good for a 90-year-old lady. And she, but she continued to do well. So there was not much of a significant loss of endothelium post-op. Can I comment? Sure. Uh, first of all. Uh, a congratulations for these two marvelous cases which were represented beautifully step by step and this is what caught my attention apart from your perfect technique the way of making the videos so if i can suggest you use masterpiece cameras which is i guess it is sony a a7000 and uh, you were the first one to show how to live stream surgical videos in youtube and uh, the visualization of the case makes you uh, a really good teacher so we need to stress that when we present our videos how to present them how to make highlights how to make stop shots increase marks so this is probably a good uh, theme for next webinar which we need to um, organize for uh, uh, you for dr uh, devgan from dr rosatelli because the way we present our cases speaks about our work and especially in your first case if you don't 
have such a good equipment for filming the video, you will realize what happened, but we, uh, we, the rest of us cannot see it if you're not presented like you do it. So thank you very much for the detailed videos and the important key points that you stressed in your videos. Thank you, Dr. Lucan. You are very generous. Well, uh, thanks for everyone participating in this meeting. Um, there is a last question here. Uh, when would you consider to perform an extra cap uh, instead of a fake co? If that's uh, if no. it's your yeah, I think you know the choice of the surgery is going to be dependent upon the uh, skill level of the surgery, uh, skill level of the surgeon with the particular technique whichever he's using and the experience levels. I think that should determine uh, the choice of surgery uh, because uh, if I were, if I'm comfortable with FACO, no problem. But somebody is not comfortable with FACO in such a case, there's no shame in doing the uh, the the surgical surgeon. With surgery which he is comfortable with, maybe SICS or ACC, both would be fine. See, ultimately, we're more interested in the final outcome which the patient is going to have. So that should be the your uh, deciding factor. Great. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Lucan said, uh, stressed it about uh, Dr. Deepak, but I may extend to everyone who participated here. I think uh, you are really doing a brilliant job of, of sharing the uh, experiences and i'm pretty sure that many of uh, of the people who were watching this were uh, is inspired by your work in different parts of of the world that's why we started this idea of making this meeting uh, happen um, unfortunately there were also colleagues that couldn't be here with us um, and as Dr. Rukan said, uh, we are also looking forward for the next meetings so everyone can, can join. Um, really, really, uh, you are inspiration for many surgeons around the world. Please, uh, congratulations for your outstanding uh, uh, job. Uh, I'd like to thank again for all the participants and the, the audience. And uh, I'll let the Dr. Chamon also do this, his closing remarks. I think inspiration is a great word and Tagushi was perfect in it. And uh, as I deal with very young surgeons from a long time, uh, I, can, I can assure you that your inspiration has moved a lot of walls. So those uh, young surgeons uh, mirror on you. Uh, for them, it's a, a honor to be here and to be listening, interacting with you all. It's important for you to know that this is part of our weekly meeting. We have a weekly meeting for more than 25 years. And when we discuss what is called surgical optics, and it includes cataract surgery, biometry, and all kinds of refractive surgery. So it is a pleasure for all of us having you among us. And uh, we can't thank you enough. I hope you have enjoyed it too. And really, we can't pay you for these two hours that you spend with us here. Thank you very much. So, thank you, guys. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. bye. Bye bye everyone and stay tuned for our next meetings. Uh, I'll send this schedule as soon as we have it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you everyone. Stay safe. <laughs>